So the thought of our message today is the x-ray and the cure. And I couldn't help but think about this message a lot during the week, and, and God kept en enlarging upon it. I want to think about this for a little bit. Um, let me, that, that x-ray right there, you can actually see a tumor if you look. Uh, you might think it's the heart, but it's not. That's a tumor in this person. Let me just read one verse first, because we've been, when we talked about DNA, we were talking about that we inherited sin and death from Adam. Remember that? And we said, just as we inherited sin, we were sinners before we sinned. You know, David said, I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. By one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So likewise, by one man, Jesus Christ, righteousness entered in and life through righteousness. So we reign in life by Jesus Christ. But verse 13 says this, for until the law. How many people think it was law and then grace? It wasn't. It was always grace. It was grace in the garden because they should have been cast into hell. It was grace in the garden. It was grace. When did the law come? Not until thousands of years later through Moses. There was no law given. It was grace. God made the covenant with Abraham by grace. He was an idol worshiping Gentile. Yes, Abraham was that good man who obeyed God. No, he wasn't. He was an idol worshiping Gentile in the Ur of the Chaldees. When God called him, there were no Jews. He started the Jews through Abraham. There was no such thing as the law. There was no such thing as the Jew. But for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there's no law. It's not put on anybody's account when there's no law. If you don't have a speed limit sign, you can't pull over a person for speeding. But there was no law. But there was still sin because people inherited sin from Adam. So they still were sinners. So knowing that, let me look at, let's look at another picture. This is an x-ray and an MRI. This x-ray shows a tumor in the person's chest right here. And this MRI, as you can see, plainly shows a tumor on the brain. Now the reason I'm pointing these out is we get so caught up in the x-ray and in the MRI that we don't even, we bypass the cure when it comes to Christian life. You say, well, what do you mean? If you went and had an x-ray and the doctor came to you and said, this x-ray has exposed your problem. You have a tumor and the tumor is malignant and short of something happening, it's going to kill you. Or if they came and said, here's an MRI and this MRI shows plainly that there's a tumor on your brain and we need to do something about it. Now, how many people think the x-ray and the MRI are a bad thing? What did the x-ray and the MRI do? Somebody answer me. What does the x-ray and the MRI do? What? It reveals the problem, right? Did it cure you? How many people would say, oh, well, thank God, now that I had the x-ray, everything's good because the x-ray shows I have a tumor, the MRI shows I have a tumor, so we're done now. You know, I've been taken care of. I paid for the x-ray or I paid for the MRI and it's over. Is it over? It's not over, is it? So do we need to get focused on the x-ray, the MRI, the ultrasound? The only thing they did was reveal the problem that's causing us pain and death. That's all they did, right? Did they cure anything? The cure is a whole different procedure, isn't it? In fact, the same people probably won't even be involved. And I'm, I know the Lord heals. I'm not, that's not what we're looking at today. We're just looking at an allegory here. We're using an example. So what do we need now? We need some kind of treatment. We need a cure. So we need to probably do surgery and remove the tumor. Or sometimes they can shrink it. My wife's sister-in-law uh, started having problems, slurred speech and all kinds of problems and just losing her mind. And they went in and checked. This was about a year ago. And she had this massive brain tumor. And so they started giving her a treatment and shrinking the tumor. And she's pretty normal now. Uh, but they had to shrink. It was pressing on her brain and just causing her to... She didn't really know what was going on. She was almost like she was losing her mind. And couldn't talk right or anything. And that's because they went in and they found, by using an MRI, they found that there was a tumor. But that didn't fix anything. Then they started a treatment. And so I want us to see it as we look into the law of God today and the Ten Commandments, exactly what God was doing and whether that was the x-ray or the cure. I want you to get, we wanted to get this in our minds. 
What was the purpose of the law? And we're going to look at only Scripture. I don't, you don't need to know my opinion, and I don't need to know your opinion. And if your opinion is different than the Word, then you have a problem. It's the Word of God. It's the pure, unadulterated Word of God, and that's all we need to know. Now, Galatians 3.19 says, Why then was the law given? Because Paul's saying we're not under the law anymore, and people had a big problem with that, and Christians have a big problem. Oh, can you believe they're taking the Ten Commandments out of this building? I don't care if they take the Ten Commandments out of the building. I don't have the Ten Commandments. Never did have the Ten Commandments. Never was given the Ten Commandments. It was given to Jews. God specifically said, this is for my chosen people, the Jewish nation. I'm going to give you Ten Commandments. Did they keep them? No. Could they keep them? No. Christians take them on and we say, well, we can keep them. No, you can't. And we try to hold on to them and say, yeah, but we need the Ten Commandments. Aunt Anna was in our house. She was in her 90s. And I kept saying, Aunt Anna, we're saved by the grace of God, right? Yes, we are. But we still have to obey the Ten Commandments. We still need the Ten Commandments. And I thought, you still don't get it. Nobody in human history has ever obeyed the Ten Commandments except one, and that was Jesus Christ. And he did it not only by what he didn't do, and he didn't do the sinful things, but by what he did do, perfect love. And love is the fulfilling of the law. I was talking to the students on a chapel on Thursday, and my wife was sitting over there, and I said, I've accepted Jesus Christ, and I'm saved by his grace. Could I go over there and hurt my wife? I could. But I have no desire to hurt my wife. I love my wife. And I, I can't stand when people hit women anyway. And I said, I, I would have no desire to hurt my wife in any way. Not, and I guess I have verbally, but I have no desire to hurt her in any way. Because I love her. And I love my children, my grandchildren. And that's why I don't want to take anything to theirs. I don't want to cheat on my wife. I don't want to... So love is a fulfilling of the law, Right? And Jesus Christ in me is what makes... I don't need anybody to say, Thou shall not hit thy wife. I mean, it is illegal, but you don't even have to tell me that. I don't want to. And so that's the difference. That people say, Oh, so with grace you can do anything? I can do anything. I don't want to do anything. Because the Spirit of God constrains me. So he says, Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. Because people were saying, they were saying, Jesus is coming to save us. And they said, save me from what? If he, what is he going to save me from? I, I, don't, I don't do anything wrong. So God did it to show them that they were sinful and needed a Savior. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. Do you hear that? King James says, till the seed should come. Seed singular. And Christians just obviously miss this because most Christian churches are Jewish. They follow the Ten Commandments. They do the daily sacrifice. Oh God, please forgive me and everything else. They're just Jewish. They're not really Christian. They don't believe in the grace of God. They don't believe in what Jesus did. They don't believe in the finished work. They say they do. They say the Christian jargon. But in actions, they deny Christ altogether. This is the Word of God. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised, and that's Jesus Christ. Now Romans says this, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. There was nothing wrong with the law, it's just that when it came in me, it created death. Paul said, I was alive without the law once, but when the law came, sin revived and I died. It showed me how bad I was. Is that a bad thing? No. Is this a bad thing? Oh, I wish I had never seen that x-ray. I wish I had never seen that MRI. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing you saw it because there's a tumor in there and that's, something's got to be done about it. That's not a bad thing. It's just not a fix. Oh, I hate that x-ray. I hate that MRI. No. I, I know you hate to see what the news is, but the news is true. It's there. And that's not a bad thing. Now you have to fix it. But what is the fix? Was then that which is good made death unto me? Was the x-ray what caused the person to have a tumor? Did the MRI give them a tumor? No. It exposed what's there. God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. God said, I want you to realize how sinful you are. 
Because Jesus is coming and you need a Savior. But if you don't realize you're a sinner, you'll never turn to him. And it's the same way with Christians today. I grew up in a strict home and I was always really good. I mean, I might have stolen a cookie or something, but I'm basically a really good person. And yeah, I guess I should receive Jesus to fulfill all righteousness. You know, they kind of think they're like Jesus. He got baptized to fulfill all righteousness. I'm really a good person. I need a little tweaking. No, you don't. You're desperately wicked. And that's... Me? You talk about me? Yeah. The Bible's talking about you. That's, you're one of the humans and you're desperately wicked. And until we see that, we'll never come to grips with who Jesus is and turn to him to be our savior. If I think I'm basically a good person, I never really did anything wrong. I kept pretty clean. I didn't drink. I didn't cuss. I didn't fornicate. I didn't do this. That still has nothing to do with it. I was born in sin. I was born spiritually dead. I received sin from Adam and I was lost from the get-go. And I do need a savior. I don't need a tweaker, I need a savior. I don't need to change my heart, oh God. I need to get rid of this heart and get Jesus in me. I can't change what I am. Flesh is flesh, but I need the spirit. This tells us plainly, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. So when people say, I want more law, I, I, I tell you, I, I was in the church before and there was a couple of them like it. They were all law. And I know my father said one time, I never saw many, so many horrible things happen to such a small group of people. Why is that? You don't even see that rate of mortality in the world. And I thought about that and I thought, you know why? Because the law demands punishment. Paul said, you that desire to live under the law, do you not hear what the law says? Listen to what the law says. You offend in one point, you're guilty of all, and the wages of sin is death. So if you want to live by the law, then you're going to die by the law. If you want to refuse the grace of God, then, and you want to earn things through your own righteousness, guess what you're getting? Nothing. So the sting of death is sin, but the strength of sin is the law. The more laws people get, the more sins they commit. When you tell people not to do something, you, you put up a privacy fence and put a hole in it and say, do not look in this hole, and you try, you watch and see if anybody can come walk by there without looking in that hole. Or put wet paint. I've had that around here, wet paint. And people have to touch it. As soon as you say don't, of all the trees of the garden you may freely eat, but not the tree in the midst. Where is it? Which tree is it? I want to see this thing. That's our human nature. So the more laws we get, the more sins we get. But how about the cure? The x-ray is not the cure. The MRI is not the cure. The law is not the cure. The law is not for us to be saved. And this scripture shows this. Romans 8, 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life, not the law of Moses, but the law of the spirit of life, the Holy Spirit in me, has made me free from the law of sin and death. How? For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of God might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It's the Spirit of God. We are not controlled by externals, but, by in, but internally by the Spirit. You look at it this way. We, we, my son has a dog in our backyard, and we have a fence. And my daughter has dogs. They have a great life. We have a playhouse back there that's shelter. He gets fed. He gets water. But you open that gate, and where does the dog go? You have everything you want. And as soon as the gate is open, boom, there's boundaries. When I was down south, if you go out on the farm, we didn't have any fences. The dogs can go anywhere they want, and where are they? You're sitting on a chair, the dog is right there. He can go anywhere he wants, but why is he here? For love of the master. He'd rather sit by his master's feet. He can go anywhere, but he chooses to be here. When you fall in love with Jesus, you can take away the fences and you'll be there because of love of the master. You'll be right there with Jesus. You say, well, can you do anything? Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. I can do it, but I love Jesus and I don't want to do it. 
oh, would you go to hell if you did it? No, I wouldn't go to hell if I did it. I don't serve Jesus because I would go to hell. I serve Jesus because I love Jesus. Do you understand the difference? The motivation's entirely different. Uh, when we left our old church, people said, so you think you can do anything you want? You're not going to hell? I said, no, I'm not going to hell. Well, then why would you serve God? I said, that's exactly the question you need to answer. Why would you serve God if you're not going to hell? So you really don't love God. You love you. Your whole motivation is to protect your own skin. But it's not about my own skin. I serve him because I love him. And I love him because he first loved me. It's his love in me. It's his faithfulness in me. That's the motivation that I have. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh. And that's not talking about just the deeds of the flesh. That's talking about the efforts of the flesh. Human effort. I don't walk after I do this or I'm trying to obey this. It's not my flesh that pleases God. It's the spirit that pleases God. I walk by the power of the spirit, not by the power of my flesh. Galatians 3.21 says this, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, then verily righteousness would have come by the law. If God could have given a law that would bring life because we were spiritually dead, it's not about behavior. We keep thinking if I change my behavior, I'm right with God. If you change your behavior, you're still not all right with God. We're spiritually dead. He took away our sins. But we're not righteous. Righteousness has to be imputed. If I stop drinking, smoking, carousing, everything else, I'm still lost. When I get to the very top, that righteousness is filthy rags in God's sight. He doesn't accept any of it. But he accepts everybody through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If you just say, okay, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. I'm not going to try to put on a front, all pious, and then we'll go around acting all holy. No. Oh, people, sometime around people that curse and they'll say, oh, I'm sorry. I said, what are you telling me you're sorry for? I'm not God in the first place. And I might have cursed if I hit my hand. Now, I'm not saying I would or that, I, that that's right. I'm just saying I'm a human. So stop thinking that anybody here is higher than anybody else. I know some people say, I never curse. Yeah, but you do a lot of other things. I mean, everybody's got some problems. Don't tell me, okay, you didn't curse, but I can tell you a lot of other things. You do. When it comes to money, man, you have a weakness. I know some people, I mean, everybody has something. So don't try to put on the front and act like somebody's better than somebody because we're not. We're all human. We're all sinful. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So knock down the fronts and stop pretending. The only people I really have doubt of that I really get uh, suspicious of are people who are acting all pious and righteous. Come in all holy all the time and acting righteous. I say, uh-huh, behind the scenes, you got on that priestly garment. What's happening back there? You know, and you know what I'm talking about with some of Anyway, the righteous act needs to go away. There's no righteousness in the flesh. We receive Jesus. He is righteous. We're accepted in the beloved, and he transforms us by the renewing of our mind. A lifelong process. When we do something, he says, it's like he holds up that mirror like we said before. We're transformed from a worm to a caterpillar, uh, to a butterfly. What do you see when he holds up the mirror? That's a butterfly, Lord. Who is it? It's me, Lord. What are you doing crawling on the ground for? I didn't recreate you to crawl and sin. I recreated you to fly. Now get up and sin no more. It doesn't make sense for a butterfly to crawl. It doesn't make sense for a child of God to be doing this. Before you used to do that, it made sense. But now that you're a child of God born in the Spirit, it doesn't make sense anymore. Do you get it? And he has to ask us, do you get it? You're not the same person anymore. You're a new creature. And he transforms us by the renewing of our mind. So if he could have given a law that would bring life, righteousness would be by the law. But there's no righteousness in the law. Even if you could stop doing all the things the Ten Commandments said, you'd still be spiritually dead. You'd still be unrighteous because righteousness comes only from Jesus Christ and it's imputed or put into your account. We're clothed in his righteousness. But the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ, that's his grace, that's faith, not the law, might be given to them that believe. Paul, Paul put it this way. He said, now if you work, like if you obey the law and you work, then it's not grace, it's wages, right? If you come and work for me, and I say, will you come and work and you worked all week? And I would say, I'm going to give you a gift today. It's Friday, I'm going to give you a check. You say, that's no gift. I work for that, John. Give me that. Well, tell me gift. What do you mean gift? You think I worked all that for nothing? 
You asked me to come work. You said you'd pay me. That's my wages. Give it to me. But if I just walked up and said, here's this, it's a gift, you'd say, well, thank you. Well, that's what God said. It's a gift. It's not wages. So don't think you're working for get Jesus' favor. Paul said, if it's work, then it's wages. But it's not. It's a gift given to us by God. Isn't it amazing that God even changed the day we worship? This is not the Sabbath. Sunday is not the Sabbath. Saturday is the Sabbath. Work six days and rest on the seventh. That's what he told the Jews. What he tell Christians? Come together on the first day of the week and rest. You rest and then we work out of appreciation. Grace gives you and then God does the works through us. We rest first and then work. Why did he put the rest first? To show us that in Christ we received the rest as a gift. We didn't work for it. We rest on the first day of the week. And then we work. You think God had something in that for us to learn? Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, what? To bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. Let's get this. It was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, but after that you come to faith in Christ, you're no longer under the schoolmaster, which is the law. Thank you. Romans 2 says this. They say, well, how come they're hearing about these Gentiles that receive Christ and they've never even heard of the Ten Commandments. They don't know the law and they're doing the right thing. And Paul said this, for when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature, because they receive the divine nature, Jesus Christ, when they do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. How are these people doing the right things? They don't even know what the right thing is because Jesus Christ is in them. And love is a fulfillment of law. They're loving one another. They're taking care of one another. They don't even know what the Ten Commandments are. You come and say, can you say the Ten Commandments? What, what? I don't know anything about the Ten Commandments. I know Jesus. But you're doing all the right stuff. That's because the Spirit is guiding me. I don't need something on the outside to tell me not to do. I don't want to do that. which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. They're not guided by a law. They're guiding by, guided by the Holy Spirit, which they received when they accepted Christ. One way this thought came to me, I, I've been in my morning devotions, I'm reading through the book of Acts, and I, and I thought this was good. Paul was going through different parts of Asia and then finally into Europe and he's preaching the gospel and telling them they're saved by grace. And the devout brethren who are ever stuck under the old system are coming along after he goes to the next town and come and say, hey, you people, you're being misguided. Yeah, it's grace, but it's also law. You've got to be circumcised, but you've got to follow the Ten Commandments. You've got to follow the law. You have to be a Jew first to be a Christian. You can't be a Christian until you become a Jew first. Because we have, you know, we have the corner on salvation. Nobody in the world can be saved unless you're one of us. And the Lord said, no, you have to be one of me. You have to be me in you. And so they started telling people this. So they finally, it was confusing the whole church. So they sent representatives, Barnabas and others, to the Jews. And the elders gathered together. And the original apostles gathered together. And they wrote a letter to them saying, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls. Now, he said they're subverting you by telling you to follow the law and the Ten Commandments. Subvert means to secretly try to ruin or destroy their souls. They don't think they're ruining their souls. They have a really good heart for God, they think, but they're not serving God. They're subverting souls to overturn or overthrow from the foundation, which is Jesus Christ and his grace, to pervert or corrupt. This is what the apostles are saying to the, about the people who are telling them to follow the law. He says you're perverted, you're corrupted, you're trying to overthrow the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. And you're trying to destroy these people's souls. This is what the apostles are writing to them saying, ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. We, the original apostles, we were with Jesus. We never told anybody to tell you to keep the law because it's not for, it's not for the Gentile. It was for Jews, and it's not even for them in Christ now. It was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Guess what? Christ is here. The law did its job. It exposed the problem. It did not bring a cure. But Christians want to hang on to the x-ray. Oh, I feel good now. 
Oh, I understand you have a tumor. It's all right, I had an x-ray. Oh, I had an MRI. But there's a tumor in your brain. doesn't matter, I had an MRI. We would say, that's pretty silly, right? But we don't think it's silly when we hold on to the x-ray, the law that was to expose sin in our lives. We still keep hanging on. The x-ray is going to save me. The law is going to save me. The law cannot bring life. If it could, then verily righteousness would have been by the law, but it's not. And it's made so plain. And people will confuse the Old and New Testament. What Jesus said, one yacht or one tittle of the law will not pass until all is fulfilled. Exactly. That was before he died on the cross. And one yacht or tittle didn't until it was fulfilled. And who was it fulfilled in? In Jesus. He fulfilled the law by his life and he upheld it by his death on the cross. He paid the punishment for it and it was over. People get mixed up. When did the New Testament start? Oh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No, at the death of, on the cross. A will goes into effect the day a person dies. The book of Hebrews says a testament is of no force until the death of the testator. When Jesus died, at that point the new covenant started. So what Jesus was doing was extending the law. He came to people who thought they were righteous. We're Pharisees. We obey the law of Moses. He said, oh yeah? You, you've read it. You're not supposed to commit adultery. I tell you, if you look at a woman to lust after, you're committed in adultery in your heart. Bam, burn. Got all of you, didn't I? Now tell me, you bunch of Pharisees going around, you never looked at a woman? Don't you lie to me. I saw your eyes when that lady walked by. I'm up here preaching. You couldn't even look at me. Couldn't even keep your eyes on me. Gawking over there. You just heard it's wrong to murder, but I say if you have hatred in your heart, you've already committed murder. Bam. Got the rest of it. You're all doomed. He buried everybody to show everybody. Jesus came and extended the law to say, it's not just the outward, it's your heart. You didn't commit adultery, but in your heart you're doing all kind of fantasizing and stuff. You're guilty. So that's what he was doing. And then we try to follow. Oh, now I can't even, oh, there's a wrong thought. That's not what Jesus was getting at. He's trying to show you, you're just, we're just messed up. Like, we're sinful. He doesn't expect any different. It's like sometimes people come in, I'm so sorry my child did this. I can't believe it. I said, please, listen. I have to stop and tell the parent. Why are you surprised? It's a young child. They're not saved yet. This is what unsaved people do. They'll come to a time when they ask Jesus into their heart. But we don't curse at my house. I said, I don't care. That's what unsaved people do. You don't have to teach them to curse. What's the first thing a baby says? No. My granddaughter was over there. No, no. I mean, this is what they do. And I'm not surprised. I did the same thing. My dad used to say he used to smack my hand till it was red. And I would go right back over. Stubbornest thing in the world. No matter what you did, I'm going to do it again. That's what unsaved people do. Until we receive Jesus Christ. Let's ask God to help us to see that what constrains us. People say then you can do anything you want. Here's what the truth is. For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all then we're all dead. And if I died with Christ I'm dead to those things. What keeps me from doing wrong? The love of Christ. I'm constrained by that. You start to do something and the Lord said it's just like he looks at you. It's like you can picture his face and say I don't want to see Jesus' eyes sad. Jesus gives me the power. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Let's all bow our heads in prayer and then we'll partake of communion. Brother James Solomon, would you lead us?